Hello and welcome to our general overview of business visas. Business visas in the United States are quite a complicated matter and there are several reasons for that. First, immigration laws and regulations fill more than 10,000 pages. I never counted them myself, but it is said that only tax law has more pages of laws and regulations. Second, two government agencies deal with these matters. The Department of Homeland Security, DHS, for all immigration matters within the United States, and the U.S. Department of State, which includes consulates abroad for visa matters abroad. And remember here that a visa issued by a U.S. consulate is basically just a travel permit. A visa is a travel document that allows you to enter the United States, but once you are here, your status is determined by DHS and evidenced by the I-94 card in your passport. Third, there are many unusual concepts that are not exactly logical in immigration law. For example, there's a distinction between immigrant and non-immigrant petitions and visas, and mixing them might cause problems. Let's say you apply for a green card permanent residence based on your marriage to a U.S. citizen while living abroad. And while the green card petition is pending, you apply for a B-2 tourist visa. With that, you have probably abandoned your green card petition because you applied for a non-immigrant visa while your immigrant petition based on your marriage is still pending. Here are the main types of business or work visas. First, the H-1B. The H-1B visa, which I call the professional work visa, to always remind myself that it requires a professional degree, usually a four-year college degree or the equivalent, a professional job offer, and an appropriate professional salary, which is called prevailing wage. An easy case would be a South African electric engineer with a four-year college degree who has a job offer from the company General Electric at an appropriate salary. Here's a difficult case. An Indian citizen with a three-year Indian General College degree who has a job offer as an office manager because it lacks the professional component. The H-1B has been almost unavailable for new applicants. The number of H-1B visas is limited currently to 65,000 per year, and they are issued on the 1st of April for a start date of October 1st. October 1st is the beginning of the fiscal year in the United States. But because there is so much more demand for H-1B visas, an H-1B petition has become a lottery game. You file your petition and USCIS will select petitions to be processed at random. Once the number is used up, all petitions not selected are returned unprocessed. Next, the L1 visa for employees who are transferred from an affiliated company. They are transferred from an affiliated company, a subsidiary or a parent company abroad to the United States. There are two types of L visas. The L1A for managers, valid up to seven years, and the L1B for technical specialists for up to five years. Both require that the employee has worked for the company abroad for at least one year out of the preceding three years. So it is possible that someone worked, let's say, two years ago for one year, took a year off, and is then transferred to the United States. So it is one year out of the preceding three years. If the company is newly established in the United States, the visas will be issued initially for only one year. For companies that have been in existence for more than a year, the initial visas will be issued for three years. The L visa has the advantage that unlike the H-1B visa, that the spouse, the husband or wife, can obtain a work permit. The L1A visa for manager has the additional advantage that it can be more easily converted into a green card, into permanent residence. 
basically one can apply for a green card directly without a so-called labor certification. Labor certification is the process whereby a sponsoring company has to prove to the Department of Labor that there are no qualified or interested workers for a specific job that will be or is being occupied by the foreign worker. Third, the e-visas. E-visas are based on treaties between the United States and specific countries. There's an E-1 visa, the treaty trader visa, for companies that do substantial international trade between the United States and the home country. And there are the E-2 visas, which require a substantial investment in the United States. That substantial investment is not clearly defined, but it should be somewhere at least in the $100,000 range. To be successful with a lower investment depends on the facts of the case. The E-2 visa is often used by individual investors to purchase a business such as a restaurant in the United States. I have successfully applied for E-2 visas for individuals to purchase a restaurant in Florida, an optometrist shop in upstate New York, and to establish a limousine service in Las Vegas. It is very important here to do a thorough business plan. E-visas are processed through the U.S. consulate abroad if the applicant is abroad. And these e-visas are usually issued for five years. Also here, the spouse, the husband or wife can apply for a work permit. Note that DHS has a different set of regulations for e-visas, which are in part contradictory. Thus, there are different rules for an e-visa issuance by a U.S. consulate and for an e-petition approval within the United States by DHS, by the Department of Homeland Security. How can these visas be turned into green cards, into lawful permanent residents? There are several immigration categories, for example, EB1, EB2, and EB3. Without going into too much detail, EB1 is what I would call high-level immigration for very qualified applicants. EB2 has several advanced categories above the bachelor's degree, and EB3 is largely for skilled workers. A typical computer programmer with a four-year related college degree falls usually into the EB3 category. The EB3 category requires generally a labor certification, the process that I mentioned earlier, processed through the U.S. Department of Labor. Nowadays, that process is automated through a system called PERM, P-E-R-M. Essentially, the employer has to test the labor market and prove to the U.S. Department of Labor that there are no qualified or interested U.S. workers for a specific job. The wait times for green cards are quite different for these different immigration categories, which are called priority dates and they are published in the Visa Bulletin of the U.S. Department of State. The wait time also depends on the nationality of the beneficiary. Historically, there is no wait time for the green card in the EB-1 category, while there may be some wait time in the EB-2 category for some nationalities at times, such as Indian citizens. And nowadays, there's a wait time of several years for the EB-3 category. While the beneficiary is waiting for his or her priority date to become current, meaning the time when one can apply for the I-485 adjustment of status, he or she needs to be in valid status in the United States. That means that a valid visa or an extension of status is necessary until the time that the I-485 adjustment of status can be filed. This is a very broad and general overview. We have specific videos on the different visa classifications, on how to obtain a green card through employment, and on how to maintain your status. Thank you.